Uh, today, I want to continue down a vein of teachings in which I have been talking to you about how we need to adjust with or, or deal with uh, the, the situation that's happening currently in the world today. What does God have to say about it? What does he want us to do? What are his thoughts on the matter? Well, I woke up a couple of weeks ago and I had this uh, word in my ear. The Lord said to me, this is not the time to retreat. This is the time to rise. This is not the time to retreat, but this is the time to rise. And what God means is that anything that he's going to do, he's going to do through us. And I talked about that in the last video. I talked about the fact that we serve a God who manifests through his believers. That is one of the main purposes of the church. And the reason we are referred to as the body of Christ is because whatever God is going to do in the earth, he's going to do through his people. And so he wants us to know in this hour of need, we don't have to cower in the corner. We don't have to back down. We don't have to be afraid, but that we can actually know without a shadow of a doubt that the God in us will come through us, manifest to the world and show himself to be strong and mighty. Amen. Did y'all hear that? We can depend on him to show up and be strong and mighty through his people. So I want to talk to us about the next uh, uh, set of uh, ideas, let's say, that God has been sharing with me. Uh, and one of the things that he has been sharing with me to share on and one of the things that he's outlined for me is to teach on the healing ministry mindset or how to think like a healer. Because again, this is not an opportunity. This, 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 this pandemic is an opportunity for the church to arise. Not a time for us to retreat. Now, let me say in the beginning of this, that doesn't mean that I condemn the decisions of those who decided to close the doors of their churches. I think one of the big things we have to come to recognize in the body of Christ is that there are many members, as Paul says, we don't all perform the same functions. If we don't perform the same functions, then we don't generally think about what needs to be done the same way. A pastor will not see this problem the same way a prophet does. A prophet will not see this same this problem the same way a, a teacher does. A teacher will not see this problem from the same perspective as an apostle or, or an evangelist. All of the gifts of God uh, uh, cause us to see um, from different vantage points. You have to understand that if you feel like you can do a certain thing, then you, of course, your response to situations are going to be different than the person who doesn't feel like they can do that particular thing. In my case, I know that God uses me in healing and prophetic ministry. Therefore, anything that arises like sickness I'm going to have a different response to because I know that I have a certain set of gifts that allow me to react and respond to that situation. Whereas a person who does not have those gifts may feel differently. For instance, my wife and I are not the same gifts. We don't have the same gifts. So her response to this situation is more practical. She's a teacher and I appreciate her response. She has taught me a lot over the years about being practical because sometimes I'm impractical because I see everything through the, the eyes of the gift of faith. So, um, so let me say I commend all the pastors who responded responsibly. I think it is a responsible thing to do to close your doors. Uh, and, and I think it's also an, another time in which the church can find a there are multitudes of ways for us to be able to reach the people in our audience. I think that I've demonstrated, and so has many other people demonstrated, 
that social media is a very effective way to reach the unchurched. It's a very effective way to reach those who have been wounded in the church and have left the church and just need a safe place to listen to the voice of God until they're healed enough to be able to be back in a, a local body. And I think it's a great way also to expand beyond your arena, right? I mean, if we live in a certain city, we don't have to only minister to the people in that city. Social media gives us avenues to reach other people in other environments and other parts of the world. I think it's an amazing technology. And I think in the middle of our conflict that we should allow conflict to cause us to reevaluate the way we do business as a nation, redo how we do business as the body of Christ, and just re, uh, uh, reconsider how we do business as individuals within our own households. There are multitudes of ways to accomplish things. One thing I admire about human beings is our resilience. When I look at the skyscrapers and I look at, oh, I'm on a plane and I'm soaring through the air over the clouds and when I'm looking at these amazing uh, vehicles and the complexity of the engines and all of the different things that we have created, and I think about how God knocked down uh, the folk from the, knocked down the Tower of Babel, I think you know we have demonstrated a certain amount of intelligence and resilience. And I think about the the, the vaccines, and I think about the the medical advancements that God has allowed us to achieve. And I think we make him proud because we show him that he created some intelligent beings, right? I think that I think that he's proud of his creation. I think we are awesome, and I think with that awesomeness, we have to realize that we're intelligent enough to find new ways to get around different problems. And this is definitely a time to do that. I wrote a book called, and I, I suggest that that everybody go out and get this book. Uh, it's called Undefiled Greatness. And it is about the voice of God in conflict. So we like to think about the voice of God in terms of dreams and visions. We like to think about the voice of God in terms of, of um, uh, hearing the voice. We like to think about the voice of God in circumstances, but we rarely think about the voice of God as conflict. And sometimes, the voice of God shows up as conflict. And I'll give you an example. God spoke to Jonah in a storm. That was a conflict. But yet in that storm was a message very vital for, jo for, for Jonah's life. God can speak in the conflicts. And I encourage you to go get that book because what conflict does is allow us to readjust and reevaluate ourselves. It allows us to reevaluate our situations allows us to reevaluate our nations so that the greatness that is in us is not hindered by conflict, but actually enhanced by conflict. So that book is going to teach you how to take advantage of the conflicts in your life, know what God is saying through the conflicts in your life, and so that you can be uh, unhindered and, and be as great as God created you to be. Now, um, that's all important. Because in the middle of the situation that we're in now, why as we reevaluate, this is also a good time to talk about the healing ministry mindset. Because again, this is our time to rise. This is not our time to retreat. I think that we have to understand that there are certain attitudes that you have to have to operate in healing ministry. There are certain attitudes. And, and to be honest with you, there are certain attitudes, as God shares this with me, that I still need to develop to be more effective effective in a healing ministry. But since we have a crisis, this is a op great opportunity for those who believe in healing ministry to arise, to take their uh, uh, place on the wall and begin to operate. And then there are those who may not be able to operate in it, but they have a passion within them that says, I want to get involved and I want to minister in this particular way. If there's a desire in you, chances are there is a gift in you. Now, I've said this several times in several other ways. A lot of times we want to know which gifts are ours. Are ours. The gifts that are yours are yours. The ones that are yours, you know them because they show up when needs arise. If ignorance is present and you always have 
wisdom showing up. The word of wisdom is in your mouth. God is giving you the ability to give divine counsel and advice or, or, or knowledge. Um, and if and likewise, if needs of sickness is present and you always have this inclination or this desire or this passion that rises in you to want to meet that need through healing, then it's because that gift is in you and that ministry may be yours to take hold of. Now, the question is, how do you operate in it? How do you move into it? To move into it, you have to have a certain attitude that has to be present for it to be effective. So what I want to do is talk to you about the healing ministry mindset or how to think like a healer, because there are certain things that you need to have in place attitude wise to be able to operate in the gift effectively. So let me tell you up front, I'm not going to get through all of these in one video. I'm going to do this as a series of videos. And so let me give you what each of the topics are going to be the points. If you're going to have a healing ministry mindset, you need to have a teachable spirit. You need to have an aggressive spirit. You need to have an authoritative spirit. You need to have a discerning spirit and you need to have a willing spirit. Let me say that again. You need to have a teachable spirit. You need to have an aggressive spirit. You need to have an authoritative spirit. You need to have a discerning spirit and you need to have a willing spirit. All of these are necessary to have if you're going to have a healing ministry. These are the kinds of mindsets and the way that you must think about healing. Let's start with number one, a teachable spirit. It is important that we understand that one of the greatest things about the ministry of Jesus was that he was a discipler. One of the things that he told us to do was not get people saved. He told us to go and make disciples. A disciple is a student of a teacher. Do you understand that? In order to be effective in the kingdom of God, every person needs to have a teacher who is instructing them. The other word for teach or instruct, it means to train. In other words, Christians need to be trained. Jesus trained his disciples. He trained them in how to live. He trained them in how to respond to opposition. He trained them in how to respond in healing situations. He trained them in how to minister his voice. Jesus was a discipler. And if we are going to meet his mandate, then we too must understand that we must be discipled or trained. The first thing you need to understand is that you have to have a teachable spirit. Let's look at, now let me say this. Effective discipleship has two components. It has the component of demonstration and application. In other words, as I just said, Jesus demonstrated healing for his people. They saw him heal. And what I want to encourage you to do, because this is not a widespread ministry in a lot of churches, right? Let me just, just be honest. It is very challenging to have faith for healing and never see healing. One of the reasons that I do have the kind of faith that I have is not solely just a gift. But early on, God put me in places where I saw him heal. When I was 17, my lungs collapsed frequently. So I went into surgery for that to repair one lung while I was in the hospital right after surgery. Like the day after surgery, the other lung collapsed, which means I was facing certain death because you can't operate on one lung until the other lung is healed. And they were waiting on one of the holes in my lungs to close up surgical holes. And it wasn't closing. So it wasn't the day after. It was a couple of days after. It wasn't closing up. And so um, my mother came in with her prayer team. And at the time, I had some things in my life. And I, uh, I was thinking about walking away from the, from, from the church. I, like, I, was, I had to go to church because that was the rule of the house. You, as long as you live in my house, 
you'll go to church. But I was about to be 18. I was going to leave and not go to anybody's church. They want to be bothered with God. Some of the things that happened in my life made me question whether he was, whether he cared or if he was real. And so when she came in, I wasn't necessarily all that excited, though in the back of my mind, I was glad that somebody was doing something because if the hole didn't close, I was facing certain death. And I was 17. I hadn't even started to live my life. So my mother group came in. They laid their hands on me. The next day, the hole closed. That moment, God got my attention. Then after that, I was a part of, it was introduced to uh, a prophet on the job who turned me on to more Cirillo's ministry. And that's why I don't let people talk about more Cirillo and Benny Hinn and all those kind of ministries because I have witnessed things with my own eyes. Not through anybody else's eyes, not through television sets, with my own eyes, there, with my own eyes. And while I was at one particular function with Moore Cirillo, I saw a boy come in in a wheelchair whose body was twisted up. I don't know what his condition was. But when Moore Cirillo began to pray and God began to move out over the audience, I saw that boy bones snap in the place. It looked as if somebody was behind him snapping his body parts into the places where they belong. And I saw him get up out of here. I saw all of his bones come into the right place. And I watched him get up out of his wheelchair. Now, some of you may say, but that was for show. No, this wasn't for show. He wasn't on the stage. I was way back in the back of the arena, in the middle of the arena. The boy was nowhere near the stage. He was uh, hundred, about 100 feet away from me in the audience. I watched it with my own eyes. To this day, I can vividly see it. I will never forget it because I was supposed to be attending to the people in my section and I couldn't do my job because my mouth was on the floor as I watched his body mysteriously put back together like a puzzle right in front of my eyes. So when you have those kind of experiences where you have seen healing, it is then impossible to undo what you have seen. So Jesus demonstrated for them. He gave them the opportunity to see healing. Now, you don't have those opportunities today in most churches. So what you have to do is then go on YouTube. There's, there's plenty of videos of people ministering in God's gift of healing. Or you need to find people in your church who believe in healing and let them and go out with them as they pray for the sick and watch people be healed. Ask them what they're doing. Let them uh, and if you are a person who operates a healer, let people travel with you. Let people operate with you. Let people go with you so that they can see. Because to have an effective discipleship ministry, you have to have an aspect of the ministry where it is demonstrated. Secondly, there has to be a period of application. Now, application doesn't mean where the person, uh, uh, um, it does. It means that the it means that the student has to have an opportunity to apply what they know. I think this is important in any aspect of ministry. I see this as a travesty in most of the time with preaching ministry. Because what generally happens with preaching ministry is people go to school or they take a couple of classes and preach it. And while you're in preaching classes, you get plenty of, of opportunities to preach. And this, you're preaching under the watchful eye of a teacher. And, and te it is generally demonstrated for you how to communicate. But then when people get outside of there, they just can't do it. And one of the reasons they can't do it, they can't do a good job or, of preaching and really can't get into any real in-depth type of preaching is because they have not, they no longer have somebody who walks alongside of them to help them be able to effectively do their job better. And because they lack the opportunity to practice. Because, and you know, I sort of understand this, nobody wants somebody practicing on their sheep. So there has to be a point in, in whether it's teaching, whether it's preaching, whether it's serving, whether it's um, prophecy, whatever the gift is, there has to be a, a point at which there is the application, the demonstration by the teacher and the point at which the teacher allows the student to apply the knowledge that he knows and he has to be applied it and over and over again 
because persistence leads to good use. Now, if you persistently do something wrong, you're going to get, you're going to be frustrated because you're going to have error. But in most cases, I think if we just use a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of wisdom and allow people to come alongside us and help us walk out these things, then we can have the things that we're after. So in order to have an effective healing ministry, I think you, you need to have some demonstration. You need to see people heal. You need to see God at work. Get around ministries. Get involved with Benny Hinn's ministry. Get involved with more Cirillo ministry. Get involved with Todd White ministry. Get involved with Dan Moyer and other people who are already doing what you want to do. Get there so they can demonstrate to you healing. And then uh, I know at least in Todd's wife, they, they actually send people out onto the street. Find you a group of people. You don't have to know what you're doing. Just find a group of people and go out with those group of people and start learning. Start doing what you've learned. So you have to have a teachable spirit. The second thing that you have to have if you're going to have a healing ministry is you have to have an aggressive spirit. This is important. Because one of the things I want you to note about Jesus's ministry is that he was always going. He was always going. And when you look at Mark 16, 15 and 19, he sends out the 70 and he tells them to go into the city. Go is a word that means you have to be willing to initiate. I will admit that I am not always willing to initiate. Sometimes I just want to wait for people to ask, but people won't ask what they don't know. And so God wants us to be aggressive in attacking the issue. Jesus was always going. And really what he was doing was making himself available to be used. Some of you are not being used by God because you're not available. You don't visit the sick. You are not around sick people. There are people you have biases against that you don't want to talk to. People you have unforgiveness with that you don't want to talk to. People that you have challenges with. So when challenges run up in their lives, you're not available to go because you're not available. So Jesus was made himself available and then he was aggressively pursuing the thing that God had told him to do. And then... He puts it in the hands of his disciples when he demonstrates it to them what he wants them to do. Then he turns it over to them to apply what they know. He does not tell them, I'm going to give you the opportunities right here in the town where I am. The Bible says he sent them ahead of him in the towns where he was going. He wanted them to be aggressive. Do y'all understand that? When Jesus encountered the man with the withered hand, he didn't wait for that man to ask to be healed. He offered to minister healing to that man. When Jesus saw the man in John 5 at the pool of Bethesda, he asked him, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made well? There has to be an aggressiveness and assertiveness on the part of those who want to operate in healing ministry. It doesn't fall into your lap all the time. You have to be willing to take the step and be bold. And I have to admit, it requires a certain level of boldness to say, Jesus will heal you. And we'll get to why and how you can get from that place of fear to that place uh, in the next one when we talk about the authoritative spirit. Because understanding that you have a certain right, right to do something gives you then the power to and freedom to move into that something. So you have to have an aggressive spirit. Are y'all with me? You have to have an aggressive spirit. If we're going to rise to the occasion, if we're going to do anything about what's happening, we have to be willing to be teachable and we have to be willing to be aggressive. Now, I also want to encourage you before I 
uh, uh, closes out. I want to encourage you that not every, don't feel pressure. This video is not for everybody. Do not feel pressured to get, jump into healing. I know that people like myself can sometimes be obnoxious as we demand that everybody should step in and do a, and get into healing ministry. But the truth is, if everybody were a part of a healing ministry, then Paul would not refer to us as members and the spirit of God would not have to uh, manifest through different people in different ways like it says, it says, and to one is given, right? To one is given. I don't want everybody to feel compelled. If you hear the word and the and you get stirred on the inside and you've been thinking about healing and it's the passion that's arising in you as a way to meet this need, it's because that is the gift that God has placed in you that he wants to bring out of you. Others of you, uh, you have a different set of gifts and your way of meeting the needs of what's happening right now, those gifts are showing up. It may be showing up in a compassionate way to make food for those poor kids who now, at least in, our, uh, in most areas, the, poor, the schools have been closed and now children who depended on school for food cannot have food. Maybe something on the inside of you is making you rise to the occasion to start making meals for the people. Maybe something else is happening in others of you. But then there's a group of us who are saying to ourselves, if this thing tries to invade or shut us down, we are prepared to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. And let me say this. Let me read Mark. Now, I know I normally read a lot of scriptures, but I'm working on doing some, some things. I'm trying to keep these videos to a reasonable length. Mark 16, and he said, go in 1650, he said, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs shall follow those who believe in my name. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I want us to understand that he's not speaking in an all-inclusive way. He's saying that these are the types of things that you're going to see from people who believe. Some of them are going to heal the sick. Some of them are going to speak with new tongues. Some of them are going to drink poison, but it won't affect them. Some of them, as it happened in the life of Paul, the apostle, are going to be bit by serpents and it will not, nothing, and, and they will be okay. So I want us to understand that yes, healing ministry is available. The gifts are available to every single person but every single person doesn't have the ministry. Some of us have the ministry. The ministry means that God presents us with this opportunity over and over and over and over again. And he likewise gives us the power to do it and also allows us to be effective at it. And it's not as a struggle or as much of a challenge because God has given us the ministry of healing, not a gift of healing. There's a difference. There's a ministry. So this is really out for those who feel a call to the ministry of healing. Now, of course, I do want people to operate in healing in general. I, and that's good. This, this will cover that. But I don't want you to feel condemned if you don't have that particular attitude. So this is our time to rise, not to retreat.